I'm Dave Bowick, of course, um, and uh, um, structural engineer. I've been doing this for about 30 years, and, and the firm that I started working for right out of school was doing some amount of, of uh, timber engineering, glue lamb for primarily for roofs of uh, pools and things. So, so we've been doing this not at this scale, but we've been doing this as, as a firm for a very long time. Um, uh, I was, um, I've, in addition to practice, I've taught extensively. So I taught at U of T in the architecture faculty for about 10 years and uh, spent a lot of time teaching at various uh, other universities doing uh, guest lecturing and, and things. Um, and I, I as personally, I've got two sort of specialties, one being mass timber and wood design and the other one being tension fabric design and, and, uh, and cables. And uh, not that those two things are necessarily related, but they're both extremely interesting. And so they're related in that sense. Mm. Um, and I'm Shannon Hilchie. Um, we're partners in life. Um, and we, we sometimes partner up in business as well when it's, when it's convenient and works well for us. Uh, I've been working in the industry for almost 20 years as a structural engineer. Uh, I worked in uh, Dave's firm for several years um, and then I branched out on my own um, doing high-end uh, installation pieces. So I, I'm lucky enough to work with a lot of artists, um, landscape architects, and then I get to kind of do the, the elements that architects find near and dear to their heart the feature stairs, the canopies, the stuff they're really passionate about. So I get to see them at their best, really. Um, and it doesn't focus specifically on mass timber, but in this world that we're in right now, it's inevitable that mass timber plays a large role in the things I'm, I'm looking at and trying to integrate it as much as possible, which kind of allows Dave and I to work really well together. Um, I'm also a professor at University of Toronto in the architecture department. I teach the structures curriculum. I've, I've noticed by looking at some of your projects and people listening now may have heard you on the Wood Solutions webinar series last year, but uh, you, you both seem to have a really good a multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary grasp of architecture and engineering. So uh, in what ways can architects appreciate engineering of timber and a little bit more and perhaps vice versa engineers um, appreciating architecture to, to have the best possible designs <laughs> it's funny uh one of the things i always say to my students is that it's not an engineer's job to say no um it's an engineer's job to give feedback and basically to try to make the vision possible um, we need to be responsible and that's where one of the reasons mass timber is so important. Um, and it's our job to um, uh, try to give, give the platform to make it as reasonable as possible to build it. Yeah, I think you were saying it's not the engineer's job to say no. It's, in a way, it's the engineer's job to say how, right? Yes. Um, and uh, and every, every design decision is a values decision. And, um, and I think as engineers, we are underserving our client if we if we try and impose our own values on the project. So, so we treat the architect as the holder of the owner's values, or as as the representative of the owner's values. If the own, if the if the architect is coming to us with an idea, it's because that idea is consistent with the values of the owner. And uh, and our job is is to tell them how what is the implication of the idea. Um, so that they can test it against those values. So if it's, um, if we think it's an expensive idea, if it's, if it's more expensive than some other idea, then we have an obligation to say that. We also have an obligation if we, if, to, to sort of tease out the underlying idea and tell them if they're possibly falling short. Um, you know, we were, we, we were collaborating with Brian McKay Lyons, who you may have interviewed actually, or if you haven't, you should, because Brian's a wonderful guy and, and a, an amazing architect, but, but he did a project called the Cliff House. And, um, and it was a house that was cantilevered out over a cliff on the, on the coast of Atlantic Canada. And it had two posts under it. And, and, uh, and I looked at that and to me, it looked like he wanted to cantilever it out. And I said, Brian, we could have told you a way to do that without those posts. 
and uh, and I had misread his values, and, and he came back and said, "No, don't don't tell me the dumb things to do. We want to do things that are pragmatic." Um, and uh, and it would have been it would have been uh, frivolous and formal to take the post down. And uh, but that's our job is to is to look at the project, understanding the un try and understand the design idea. Um, and then, uh, and then give the architect the feedback to, to make the most of the design. And so sometimes it's, it's advising of, of, uh, of the implications, whether it's cost or scale. And, uh, and sometimes it's telling them, hey, you could have done this. It looks like you were trying to achieve this and here would be how you would do that. And it's, it's interesting because in university, I find engineers, and I know for me explicitly, you probably found the same thing, Dave, um, we're not taught anything about architecture. Mm. We're just, we're taught some math and we're taught how to make things stand up um, and uh, kind of gives us this sense that it is our responsibility to say yes or no. Um, and I know that I've been lucky enough to work with architects that have uh, showed me how to get beyond that. Um, they, they're the ones that have showed me such beautiful designs that I can stop and say, okay, I see why it's not my job to just say no. And I have to try to help you build this thing that is so glorious. It's true, isn't it? I mean, in, in school, material optimization is, is the singular thing that we're taught. And, uh, and so it's the only value that we come out of, out of school with and everything else is acquired. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I, when I did uh, engineering at university, there was no, uh, no mention of design or art or uh, anything like that, or actually negotiating and working with architects in that sense. Um, and one of the designs or a field you've been pioneering in was uh, reciprocal frames. I mean, traditionally, if you were asked to span eight meters, you'd have an eight meter member, but you really, you found a way and shown a way where, no, you don't necessarily have to do that. You can frame um, in novel ways to get like a great design, great looking, design but also um, span a bit further with certain members can you tell us a little bit about uh, that that space and and how that's going well I mean reciprocal frames are fascinating to me they um, and at first I, I really thought that not that they were they were frivolous but it was a design a formal design idea it was just really about the form um, until we started really looking at the implications of them um, so reciprocal frames Go back an awful long time. Serlio was doing reciprocal frames. Leonardo da Vinci had sketches of, of uh, reciprocal frames. And the early reciprocal frames had, we were really about, about one objective, and that was how do you span farther than your longest member? Um, and uh, uh, so Leonardo had a reciprocal frame bridge, and they had reciprocal frame uh, flat floors. Um, and um, uh, and then Zollinger, after the Second World War, was trying to do long span structures when all the, the steel had been devoted to the war effort. And, and so he was trying to do long span structures using, using timber and also to address a, a severe housing, housing shortage following the First World War. Sorry, I don't know if I said second, but it was following the First World War. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so he then developed the curved lamella. Um, now his was a Gothic arch in form, um, but it was a curved lamella, so a, so a fine grain reciprocal frame, short short members, long spans, um, and then that was um, extrapolated to to some quite long spans with very shallow arches that were then used for for hangar structures um, and uh, uh, hangar structures and other long span structures following the Second World War. Um, so the, the reciprocal frames was, was an utterly pragmatic solution to a problem. How do you achieve long spans with small members and short members so that they could be built with timber? Um, when Shannon and I started doing reciprocal frames, it was a formal idea. We, we were challenged by an architect to come up with an idea for how to do a modern longhouse, which is a traditional native building form, um, and they were the uh, the architect was doing doing uh, the native child and family services building in downtown Toronto. They're a modern architect. They wanted a modern interpretation. They challenged us, and 
and we had seen these reciprocal frame structures, we thought they were really interesting. And so we, we extrapolated the reciprocal frame to generate this longhouse um, form. And it, it's because we work so much in steel or have been over the past 30 or 40 years, even though the, um, even using steel or wood from what Zollinger was working with, we've had a lost use of the reciprocal frame method because we were able to just make long members and engineers stopped thinking about it. Um, and as Dave said, indigenous structures um, a long time ago, and this is very relevant here in Canada now, I'm sure it's relevant for, for you guys as well in Australia, um, kind of getting back in touch with those indigenous practices is really valuable and identifying that they know how to do this so well, even before Leonardo and um, mm -hmm. all the names Dave mentioned, um, they, they had their finger on this. There was, there was something there and we're, it was really nice to be able to bring that back into the longhouse. We felt very smart. We felt like we were discovering it. Um, but no, it was, uh, it was an ancient practice we were going back to. Well, that's where reciprocal frames really fall out of the weaving tradition so, so directly, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. and then, and then we have since done, done other work realizing that, that a reciprocal frame is a, because it's a two-way system, it's a really effective way of, of distributing load to sort of four walls, for example, if that's a, if that's a need, um, and and a whole floor becomes engaged. So so in fact, even if they're they're not stiffer than a conventional two-way or one-way system, they may perform better in terms of vibration because because it's a two-way system and the whole thing is integrated. The uh, even if the uniformly distributed load generates um, the same static deflection, the point load deflection will be less uh, because the whole floor is engaged. Makes sense. And uh, obviously serviceability and vibration is a critical part for timber design. Um, what are, We've spoken and you had some fundamental principles for architects and engineering um, and understanding those professions. There's obviously uh, the installation side of things. So is there anything fundamental principles of construction engineering or, the, or working with prefabricated timber for the installation side of things that um, listeners should, should know about or keep in mind? Well, I mean, there's the, there's the very, very practical things. Um, and often what we think about for, for a lot of our projects, especially if you're not talking about a large project, we really think about um, a, a truck. How big is a truck? And that tends to be our limiting factor for most things. What can you do with the size of a truck? And for here, it's about 50 feet by eight and a half feet. Yeah, a little, little yeah. over eight feet. You, can, you don't need special permits. You don't need escorts. And 12 feet you can do without a permit, but an escort and, you know, there's, there's these various shipping sizes. And obviously for a cost, you can do almost anything, but, but if you can get your head around that, that is kind of the first barrier to, to, to um, developing your prefabricated elements. Repetition is huge. Yeah, repetition is one of those funny things, right, where, where um, we know that it has a tremendous impact on cost, but it just doesn't have an impact on price. So, <laughs> so, the, uh, so we, we make it repetitive. We save the fabricator money, but, uh, but the owner is paying, for, paying by the cubic yard anyway. And uh, uh, so, so it's an interesting thing. We know it, we know it affects <laughs> Uh, it's probably something the fabricators have been and push and suppliers have been pushing as opposed to anyone else. Is that right? right. Yeah. <laughs> so sometimes we'll go through and try to find as much as we can make repetitive that isn't egregious. So what what is just a nominal difference um, to make it as repetitive as possible, and then focus on those really high end elements or the feature elements or the ones that are special, the ones that differentiate from the rest of the building and focus a lot of attention on those. The other, the other, the thing that that is paramount for us right now as we're as we're building taller and taller is um, is protection during construction, and two types of protection. One is protection from the elements, which is critical in our climate and and in, in much of Australia too, I imagine. But but certainly on our climate, protecting the structure during construction from the elements because. Uh, you saturate wood, it's, it, that doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna, the wood is going to be a problem, but it'll swell, it'll shrink, it'll stain, 
and um, and you know all the, all the you may lose some of the benefits of, of mass timber construction if uh, uh, because part of the reason to do it is aesthetic. Um, so protection from the elements during construction. So you know we're we're trying to limit the number of un, unenclosed floors. You know if we're if we're at um, um, you know a, a common guideline right now is is not more than four unenclosed floors at a time. So you've got to be following up with the enclosure very rapidly. Um, and then the other one is fire protection during construction. It's um, we have not seen major fires in mass timber buildings during construction. We've seen lots of very major fires in light wood frame buildings, not in mass timber buildings, but notwithstanding that there, there's a great deal of um, apprehension from both building officials and the insurance industry. Um, and so there's a lot of discussion on how to, how to fire protect the structure as it is being constructed, um, ensuring, um, it, it particularly means of egress are either non non combustible and or fire protected. Um, so those are some of the major things that we're we're dealing with as as buildings. You know there isn't a there isn't a well established typology for the 15 story mass timber building. Every single one is new, and we're sorting these things out as uh, as the buildings are being designed. Mm. Yeah, I feel like the. Yeah, protection on site from moisture and, and also UV. It's just very easily just to not not think about it up front in the design and then um, yeah, later down the track. And yeah, the range of tolerances which you might allow for, you know, you might expect shrinkage, but then if you leave it out on site, all of a sudden you got swelling and then um, tolerances get blown out on site. Yeah. Um so and have in, in Canada at the moment, what's uh what's the the market growing like over there for, for timber buildings? Is it increasing? I understand you for, which is really interesting for us in Australia, it might not be that much of a surprise for you, but uh, a lot of your five story, four, five, six story buildings are of lightweight construction with just your stud framing. Is that, is that correct? And uh, yeah, tell us about what the, what the split is or percentage of buildings that go up in light frame over there. Well, not that long ago, we just weren't allowed to build over four stories in wood in Canada. With our massive wood industry, we had a hard line that we couldn't build over that. Um, and that was pretty much light frame construction, uh, re typically residential. Um, you could use glue lamb, but it usually wasn't uh, the primary source, and usually one or two story, maybe three or four institutional size projects and that's where we were focused on with blue lamb clt um and uh recently so i think 2018 wasn't it where the 2012 was six stories I think. 2012 was six stories but it, it takes a while for it to get adopted so the building code allowed it in 2012 but the regional codes didn't for several years um and then um uh, once they allowed that, they knew they could see they could see the market changing, um, and so they made it a lot easier to allow um, kind of special special applications of of projects. Um, and we've been finding that the building departments, even though now they kind of still have a cap of uh, of what is it. Six stories still for light wood frame, but now we've got mass timber up to 12 stories wow. in the national building. But there are even still, the local building departments are very open to this idea. They, they know it's happening. They love it, um, which it's not very often that you have building departments kind of unanimously saying, we want this new innovative thing happening. Um, and so they're really willing to work with the engineers. And the reason I couldn't even name the number off the top of my head is because there's so many going on above 12 stories um and you, you still have to go through all the work you have to you have a lot more to prove it's not kind of by rote in the building code there's a lot more responsibility on the engineer but people are interested and people want this to happen yeah sometime around 2000 the building code instituted a, an alternative solution provision where that allowed you if you could demonstrate that you met the uh, technical intent of the building code even if you didn't meet the explicit prescription of the building code, you're allowed to make an alternative solution. And that, and that wasn't just in application towards mass timber, it was for 
fire, yeah. for anything. It was for any kind of specialty item, but it really opened the door for ideas around mass timber to develop. Right. So, so, so some of our projects, the, the academic tower at University of Toronto, for example, is, is 14 stories. It's well beyond what's permitted in the building code explicitly, um, but we've made an alternative solution submission and, and demonstrated compliance with the intent of the building code. Um, so right now, certainly light wood frame is much more economical than mass timber. And so everything that is permitted to be built in light wood frame generally is, you know, six stories and under um uh up to a certain area is more likely to be light wood frame because it's very economical um but we are seeing an awful lot of, you know I, I think every institution every academic institution is doing their mass timber building in canada right now i think yeah so we, we certainly are seeing an awful lot of demand yeah yeah fantastic uh, so it, it is always interesting getting a perspective from the other side of the world so in australia we've got eight stories up to eight stories currently fully fire protected. Is your, um, is your uh, explicit, I think you called it in the International Building Code, does that mean all timber needs to be fire protected or does, does it allow for a certain amount of timber to be exposed as part of the, you know, the simple compliance pathway? Yeah, our, our 12 story, the National Building Code is now permitting 12 stories and that is a fully encapsulated solution. So I know the International Building Code in, in the U.S. Has, has a graduated level of encapsulation depending on, on the height. But in Canada, our 12-story solution is encapsulated. Um, but that said, that's, that's, for, that's the simple pathway, as, as you've said. The alternative solution is, uh, will allow it to be exposed. So the, the academic wood tower has a lot of exposed wood, even though it's 14 stories. Yeah, fantastic. And what do you see as the next round of uh, innovations coming in in timber in the future? Well, some of it is is knowing what your limitations are and how to work with um, other materials. Um, to go higher, um, if we want to make the most use of the timber market, we have to understand where it's the most useful. Um, and that's not necessarily always making the entirety of a tall tower every element would. Um, it's knowing when we need to combine it with a little bit of steel and when we need to combine it with a little bit of concrete uh, to kind of make the best use of all of those properties. Um, Dave, Dave and I have both described it as the wild west of construction right now in the wood industry. Everybody's figuring out everything on their own and we don't have a kind of a precedent list of things to look at. So everyone is figuring it out from scratch for every project. Um, and in the next few years, we're gonna start to see projects being built um, and we're gonna know what was economical and what wasn't. Um, it's not about what was safe and what wasn't because we have building departments following that and everyone's got such a close eye on this. It's all about being safe. It's going to be what was the most economical um, and trying to kind of hone down on that to the, to the smallest of the details, what was the best way to build this. Yeah, as Shannon said, I think it's, you know, it's, it's hybridization, right? It's, um, um, it's knowing what the fine balance is of mass timber and other materials. Because, for example, what we're finding is, is that as you, as you start getting tall, column sizes in mass timber just become impossible. So it becomes the entirety of your floor. Yeah. <laughs> so column sizes are, are, are really unrealistic. And so, so we're looking at, at hybridizing with, with steel columns or or steel columns encapsulated in wood, where the wood, the wood will carry, you know, four or five stories of structure and then transfer it to the steel, and then the wood is also the fireproofing on a steel column. So, so that kind of hybridization. The other thing we're finding, and I'm sure it's the same in Australia, the wood prices in in, in the last two years have skyrocketed, and uh, so wood was already seen to be a fin like a, a financial premium. And now it's out of reach. And so solutions that optimize material use in, um, in new ways are really interesting. So we're seeing some that, that are sort of acknowledging we need a concrete topping for acoustic sound transfer anyway. Why don't we do away with the deck and use, use the concrete topping that we need for acoustics as our deck element and, uh, and find ways of making that composite with wood with with um, blue lamb beams using steel columns and 
So I, I think that because buildings are getting bigger and bigger and they're getting taller, finding that fine balance, as Shannon said, is the uh, is, is where the real innovation is going to come. And and as much as I hate to say it, there is a limit on the timber is so popular right now. There is a limit on the resource. With any resource in the world, there is a limit. And if we're going to be responsible and reasonable, we want to make sure we're not deteriorating all of those markets. So we have to use each of them as smart as we can. And kind of the other side to the innovation isn't on the structural side, it's about the forestry management side. And we know here in Canada, that's a number one principle. Um, we've been lucky enough to present and talk with um, a lot of kind of the leading people on that side of the industry um, and see how, how, how important they understand that is and how important it is to do it responsibly. Um, and so maximizing the best use of that wood and the available wood market is really important. Absolutely. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Uh, if people want to find out more about yourself, Shannon and David, where, where should they go? Well, you can probably find more about me at our website, which is, which is a simple one, blackwell.ca. Um, at least there's a project list and there's probably a, 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 a short bio or something. Um, um, and, and Shannon, on your website is probably the best one as well, right? Yeah, so my, my, I'm a fatlab.com, but it's not the normal way to spell fat. It's F-A-E-T lab, because I had a fat lab, but all the cool ways of spelling fat were taken, so I had to make up my own. <laughs>